Good morning, everybody. Welcome to a rainy overcast morning of Chem 1105 with your host, me, Dr. White. Hi, everybody. All right, a couple announcements. First of all, on next Monday, our next class, I will go over chapter one, problem set. Again, I'll go over chapter one, problem set. But I highly recommend you try it before I go over it. I'm not going to go over every one, but I will go over key problems. And if you're here live in my lecture, that sounds weird. If you're here, ask questions and I'll do other problems too from the problem set if you'd like me to. All right, that's announcement number one. Announcement number two. I talked about the law, uh, distance learning contract, which is in uh, Blackboard for you to fill out and upload as a PDF file. And I mentioned it yesterday, but this morning I put an extra note. Hold on. Let's do this. All right, let's do this. All right, you should all be able to see Blackboard announcements. If you click on assignments, I'm in student view. You'll see for the safety contract, I added, you get three, and I mentioned this, but I put it in writing so you can see it, get three, three bonus points if you submit this contract signed before 4 p.m the 23rd, which is tomorrow. So please get that uploaded as a single PDF file. I have instructions here, both as a Word doc and a PDF file, how to do that. And if you don't have a scanner, but you do have access to a cell phone, if you want, there's instructions where you can do it directly, or you can use this app, Scam, Cam Scanner, and use the free version. You don't need to use the paid version. So please get the safety contract uploaded as soon as possible. All right, what I'd like to do first is because you'll need to know how to do this. I'm gonna go through for my calculator and if you have a different calculator, it's about the same how to do scientific notation. Now, I'm gonna do something that sometimes is a little funky, but I have a second camera here that I'll be using to show the this, because holding it up like this doesn't work as well. All right, let's look at the following. Well, if you have this two times two, well, you know, oh, I know that's four and two times eight is 16. But what if you have two times 10 to the third times eight times 10 to the fifth? What does that equal? Well, how do you do that? Well, if you know, if you use the slide rule like I did in grad school and undergrad, or calculators were invented. Oh, yep, I'm that old. You would know how to do this. Well, the easier way nowadays is with your calculator. All right. Great moments in dual camera technology. Here we have my calculator. Eventually, I'll focus. Come on, focus. I'm going to turn it on. Now, up here, 
on the top, you'll see this blue button. And over here above, it says Psi and ENG. When you hit the second key, blue button, and that key, notice on top, it has FOL, flow, regular numbers, SI, SCI, scientific notation. And I've never used engineering, so I don't know what that stands for. It's You can use the cursor here to move it. Once it's on scientific, then hit enter. Nope, I'll never be a hand model on TV. Now you're in scientific. Now we want two, and I hit the number two. Now to get scientific notation, you do the blue key, and then you'll see a key that above it, X to the minus one and above is a blue double E. And I'll click on that. And you'll notice there's an E there. That's like 10 to the power. And I think I had in my example three, I don't remember it right now. And now to multiply that, I'll hit this key. And now I want eight. Then again, to get 10 to the power, second key, blue, double E blue. You'll see the E come up again. I don't know, what did I have? I'll put four. Now I'll do six. Now I'll change it on the black on my whiteboard. And now you hit enter. And if you look here, you'll see 1.6 X, then very tiny 10, that means 10, then a larger right here, 10. So the answer is 1.6 times 10 to the 10th. And that's how you do it. Oh, let's do that again. I'm gonna clear it. Oh, let's do 3.2. Times 10 to the fifth. So when I want that 10 to the fifth, I'll do double, second key blue, then this double E, then an E will show up on here. I think, what did I say? S six. And now I'm going to multiply it by, I don't know, 4.2 times 10 to the fifth. So again, blue key, then you want above the X to the minus one on my calculator, it's a double E, click it, and the E shows up. And I think I said 10 to the six. So I'll put a six, click six, and then I'll hit equal. And you'll see right here, focuses, 1.344, then X, little X, little 10, and then a bigger 13. So the answer would be 1.344 times 10 to the 13. Now for division, instead of using this, you'd use this button. So let's do one, 2.5, which I put here. Let me clear it again. 2.5 times 10 to the third, second key, then double E, and I want 10 to the third, so I'll do the number three and see how it came up. And I'm divide now. And notice you see the slash instead of the star, and I'll have 9.3. Five, I did 9.5, and now times 10 to the, I don't know, uh, fifth, uh, fifth. So second key, double E, and now I'll hit the number five, and you'll see it's 9.5 E, that means 10 to the power, and the power is five. Now I'll hit enter. Now it gave me a long number, 2.63157894 times 10. Now notice right here, there's a minus sign. And that would be 
times 10 to the minus zero. Now, one important thing, oh, for those who you're wondering, this is my office. Here's some of my flashlight collection, my electronics. Next to me is my hobby desk that I work at and some projects I'm working on. And I'll give you a sneak peek of my newest project. It's hard to see the light on a camera like that, but it's red. And if we wait, it's changing color to purple and then to blue. This right here is a microcomputer. Anyways, you got to see Dr. White's inner sanctum. All right, let's talk about what happens if you want to do the following. Well, let me change something so I'll remember it. Normally when I'm working on stuff like this, I'll have, I won't be using that second camera. All right, question is, what's the answer to this problem? Two times 10 to the minus two times four times 10 to the minus four. Well, how do you do that? Let's go back to the other camera. Let's stop share. All right, so we want to put in, let me get the wire out of the way, two. So first of all, always make sure you clear it before you start. I'm going to do two right here. Now I want times 10 to the minus two, blue, the double E right here. Now, how do I do minus? You don't use this one over here. This is for subtraction. To get minus on your keyboard, you'll see paren minus close paren. And when I click that, you see right here, there's a minus sign. So now I want minus two and I'll click the button two. So notice you have two E minus two. Again, to get the minus, you use this key, not the one over here. This is for subtraction. So we want to multiply this times. So I'll hit the times right here. You see the star, four. Now I want times 10 to the minus four. Blue key, the double E, I want minus four. Use this key, not this key. This is subtraction. On your keypad, that's minus beige, you have bracket minus close bracket, click on that, and you see the minus sign, and now we'll do minus four. So we'll hit the four, and notice you have two E, which means times 10 to the minus two times four E means 10 to the minus four. And now I'll hit enter, and you'll see it has eight, and it's not that clear. There it is, times 10 to the minus six. You see right here, they have that tiny little X 10. That means eight times 10, and then the minus sign zero six. And that's how you do, oh, let's do another one. Let's do a division. So I'm gonna clear it. I'm gonna do five, times 10 to the minus fifth. So I'm gonna do second key, double E. I want minus five 
So I'll use this key on the keyboard with the minus, and you see the minus sign up here. You don't see that minus sign. Guess what? You didn't push the right key. Now I want minus five, so I'll hit the five key, and I'm going to divide it by 8.2. So I did 8.2. Here's your decimal point. Then times double second key, double E. And now we want minus oh, eight. So this key I just press, and you can see now there's a minus sign after the E, and I'll put eight, and now I'll hit enter. Ta da! And it gives me this number 6.09756 something, something, something. And then over here is x10, that means times 10 to the second or second power. And that's how you do it. So when you're doing scientific, you put in the number in the front. Ooh, let's do this. And if I were to want to multiply 8.5 10 squared times 2.3 times 10 to the minus 2, always clear it. I'm going to put in first 8.5. And now I want times 10 squared. So I'm going to do blue key, second key double E, it's above here in blue, and you'll see an E there. I want the number two, so I'll click on two, and you'll see 8.5 E means times 10 to the second power, and I want to multiply it, this key, times 2.3, so I'll put in two point three. Now to get to power of 10, I want minus two. Second key, double E. And now to get minus, you use this key, not this key. This is subtraction. This is 10 to the minus whatever. And we want minus and we want two. And notice it says 2.3 E is 10 to minus two. And I'll hit enter. And it gives me 1.955. Then it's real tiny times X 10. And the bigger number after the 10 is 10 to the one power. Zero one is one. And I'll clear it, turn it off, turn off my camera. or not turn it off, go to my other camera. I've got two of these to back up. Also, it's good. When the pandemic, I had an old one and a friend of mine had a newer old one that he lent me that I was finally able to get the Logitech that I'm using now. And then about a year ago, I said, I should have a backup. So I bought this and that helped me do what I just did. I don't know how many of your instructors can do it two Zoom cameras at the, on the same lecture. Who cares? <laughs> you should go back, look at the video, and practice with your own calculator. Now, your calculator might, let me shut this off. Your calculator might be different than mine if you're having trouble with it either after class or in my office hour, come and we'll work it out. I haven't found a calculator yet. I couldn't master doing what I just showed you. All right, any questions? Going once, 
going twice. Well, in that case, let's get to back to work. Now, yesterday I was talking about operational rules for numbers that are significant figures. You use significant figures. And for multiplication division, the number of the significant figures in the answer is the same as the number of significant figures in the measurement, meaning the number you're using, that contains the fewest significant figures. So what does this mean? Well, let's take a look. All right, what if you wanted to do this number? Hold on, let me do a, well, let me do this one. This should be all right. And the question is, what's the answer? And this sort of calculation, you will be doing a lot, various problems you'll be solving in this class. And relax, I'm gonna teach you how to do the math and we'll do plenty of practice problems. You should know that by now. And so I'm gonna pick up my calculator and this one, I'm not going to use the second camera because I'll just write down the answer. And it's 2.45 times 10 to the third times 8.333. Second key, double E, times 10 to the sixth. I multiply it. And here's what my calculator has on the screen. this number. And the question is, is this the correct answer concerning significant figures? And the answer is no. So how do you get the correct answer? Well, you look at the first number, how many significant figures? All non-zero numbers are significant. So this has three. You look at the second number, forget about the 10 to the power that we don't use. And how many significant figures in the second number, 8.333? All non-zero numbers are significant. One, two, three, four. So this has four significant. Now we're gonna do some hard math. Which one of those numbers is smaller? And time's up, hopefully you pick three. So this number that our calculator gave us to get the right number, since it's a multiplication, the answer should have the same number of significant figures as the number you're multiplying or dividing that has the fewest significant figures, and that's three. Well, how do we get 2.041585 to three significant figures? You round off. Keep the first significant figure. Keep the second. Keep the third. The next one you use to round off because we wanted to keep three significant figures. Is that four or less or five or higher? What is significant figure work is thirsty? Work. And the answer is it's four or less. So that means you drop everything, that number and afterward, and you get this number. You don't change this 10 to the power. And this is your answer. Notice it's three significant figures. And I'll be using the abbreviation SF when I, instead of wasting our time writing out significant figure all the time. So let's go through this again. For this calculation, you put the numbers in your calculator, just like I just taught you. Your calculator is going to give you a wild big number. I don't know about wild, but really many significant figures. And if you put that on a test, I'll take off maybe one or more points. Because on my test, test one, two, three, and four, 
and the final. Underneath where it has your name, it has a note. Please use proper significant figures for all calculated answers. Again, underneath your name, you will always have for my test one, two, three, and four, and four tests, and the final. Please use proper significant figures for all calculated answers. And therefore, if you had to multiply this number times this, your calculator will give you this number and you have to round it off. And you round it off by using the operational rules that when you multiply or divide, you get the same number of significant figures as the number that has the fewest significant figures. And you have to know how to figure out how many significant figures. We went through that on Tuesday. Go back and look at the video. All right, let's do another one. Hold on. Once in a while, I'm doing these numbers on the fly. I'll change my And the question is, you've got to figure out what is this equal to? 8.6 times 10 squared times 1.2567 times 10 to the third. Well, first of all, I'm going to put those numbers in my calculator. Eight point six times ten squared times one point two five six seven times ten to the third power. I'll hit equal, and my calculator gives me this number. That's a six. And this is what my calculator gives me. If you put that down, I'll take off a point. Why? Because you should have the same number of significant figures in your answer that the number you're multiplying or dividing that has the fewest significant figures. So now you have to figure out each number, how many significant figures. All non-zero numbers are significant. The first number has one, two. So it's got two significant figures. The second number has one, two, three, four, five significant figures. When you multiply and divide, the number you get should be the same significant figures as the number with the fewest significant figures. In this case, two. So you have to round this number off to two significant figures. Keep the first one. One is significant. After a decimal, all zeros are significant. That's my second one. And now the next number I use to round off because I got my two significant figures, and that's eight. And when I do these problems, the number I'm using to round off, I always put these double squiggly lines here. So you can see what number I'm using to round off. And the question is, is that number eight, four or less, or five or higher? And time's up. Hopefully you pick five or higher. And therefore, when it's five or higher rounding off, you drop everything afterward when it's a decimal like this in my class. This is the way it's going to go because you're using a calculator and scientific notation. And you increase the number in front by one. So if I increase this by one, it's 1.1. This stays the same. And that's how you do it. I'm going to do one now where I'm going to ask you, and I just remembered, oh, I forgot to set up a poll. I'll have to do that today or tomorrow. So I'll have to do thumbs up today.
let's assume you had to, in a problem, do the following calculation. It's the same thing for division. I can do a division later, but so let's put this into our calculator. 2.34 times 10 to the sixth times 1.2 times 10 to the fifth. And when I hit equal, my calculator gives me this number. Now, that's not the correct number because you have to have the right number of significant figures. Your turn. Why don't you try it? And when you're done, give me a thumbs up. Question is, how many significant figures should your answer be? And round it off to that number. I see one person's done. We'll wait to give everybody time. If you want me to go ahead and you, and you haven't really finished what you want me to go ahead, give me a thumbs up emoji for those who haven't done it yet. All right, let's do it. Remember, when you're multiplying, dividing, which this is, you get the same number of significant figures in your answer as the numbers you're multiplying, dividing that have the fewest significant figures. And if we look at this, all non-zero numbers are significant. I made it easy. For our example, one, two, three. So that has three significant figures. Now, if we look at the second number, all non-zero numbers, remember you ignore this for significant figures, 10 to the power you don't use for significant figures, you use the number in front of the multiplication or X, and that has two non-zero numbers, so this has two significant figures. So we now have to round this number to two significant figures, this number right here. Keep the first non-zero number or significant figure two. The next one is eight. Those are two significant figures. The next number we use to round off. Is that four or less or five or higher? And the answer is five, four or less. And I'm gonna drop that and drop that. And the answer would be 2.8 times 10 to the 11th. And that's our answer. Because if you notice, this has two significant figures and the number you get when you multiply and divide should have the same number of significant figures as the number that you multiply and divide by that has the fewest significant figures, which in this case, two was less than three. Any questions on that? And I have a problem set for this, and we'll go through later next week, probably, some of the problems set for A2 and A4, Appendix A2 and A4, which you'll have a chance to practice what I just did, including with your calculator. And then you can see me do some of the problems. Now, for addition and subtraction, the answer has no more digits to the right of the decimal point than are found in the measurements, the numbers you're adding that have the fewest digits to the right of the decimal point. Now, we're not gonna be using addition. We don't do, I don't think we do any subtraction in this course, but we won't do addition for a week, at least two weeks, if not longer. So I'm gonna skip this right now. I'll give you a quick example, but I'm going to skip it 
because when we go through it again, when you need it, you'll probably have forgotten it since we haven't used it. But let's look at the following. And the question is, what's the correct answer using significant figures for this number? Well, if you put in your calculator, I can do it in my head. If I didn't do it correctly, somebody tell me, this is what your calculator would have given you. But this is not the right answer. And this type of rounding off took, or significant figures and rounding off, took me a while to get my wrap my brain around it. But here's our decimal point. And you look at the number of significant figures to the right of the decimal point, any number zero two would be significant. This one has two significant figures. This one has three significant figures. So now this one has three, which of these two numbers is lowest? Hopefully you pick two. So we have to round this off to two significant figures to the right of the decimal. And how do you do that? Here's my decimal point. Here's the first significant figure to the right of the decimal, all figures will be. Here's my second. And now we'll use this to round off. Is that four or less? Yes. So the correct answer for this using significant figures is that. Now, I might have a couple of problems on the problem set in A2, A2 and A4 for addition to skip them. Because one of the things I've learned in teaching is the student is going to use something for a long time. Don't teach them now and then expect them to remember it later on. Wait until they need it. All right, so those are the operational. Most of what we'll be doing this semester is multiplication division. And we'll do more when we go through the problem set. Now, exact numbers are not considered when determining the number of significant figures. What does that mean? Well, let's look at an example. I almost started writing cursive and I keep on forgetting at times. A lot of students don't know cursive. So, if you had to do this on a test, what's temperature in degrees at Fahrenheit if the temperature is 45.6 degrees Celsius degrees C? So we're trying to find degrees F. Remember I taught you yesterday, when you have a word problem, relax. You'll learn how to do word problems. I'll practice with you. This is a word problem. What are you being asked to find? I like to put a question mark and what are we being asked to find degrees F? And I put down, what are we given? Now, you'll be given this formula, important information, test number one, degrees F equals 1.8 degrees C plus 32. So I know Degrees C is 45.6. And now I'll pick up my calculator. Clear it. 1.8 times 45.6. And I get a number. And now I'll add to that plus 32. Now, 
Now, my calculator, because I have it in scientific notation, gives me this number. Now, watch closely. In this formula, 1.8 is an exact number. Thirty-two is also an exact number, so they play no role in determining how many significant figures your answer should have. But what does have significant figures is this temperature. How many? All non-zero numbers are significant. Three. This is the only number you use in this calculation to determine how many significant figures your answer has. In this case, it's three. So now we have to round this off to three significant figures. Keep the one, keep the one, keep the four. Those are my three significant figures. And the number to round off is the next number, which I put the double squiggly lines. And that's a zero. Is that four or less or five or higher? And hopefully you pick four or less. And I drop that and that. And the correct answer here is 1.14 times 10 squared. And that's how you consider exact numbers. Now, any formula we use in this class during the lecture when I practice with you, like this one, I will always point out what are exact numbers. Now, in the future, I might use the abbreviation because it cuts down on wasted time, this, or without, or I'll just write this and point to something, exact number. Remember, exact numbers are not used to determine significant figures of your answer. The only thing in the calculation you look for, what's a significant figure? In this case, the temperature. This is a measurement, and the way I have it written, that's three significant figures. We'll do more of these. Dr. White, yeah. I have a question. But what would, what's the difference between 1.8 and 45.6? I mean, they both are All numbers right. with decimals. That's a very good question. Thank you for asking it, Katie. All questions are good. Now, when I taught you this, there's a formula somebody discovered or figured out that to go from Celsius to Fahrenheit, you use this number, this formula. Now, in the formula, it's always going to be 1.8, it's always going to be 32. That's why those are exact numbers. Someone came up with the rules for rounding off. It's something I've never looked at on the internet. I don't know if I ever will, but you know, how do they come up with these rules of rounding off? I don't know, but everybody in chemistry uses them. I've used it in a story I told yesterday about that measurement and rounding off. But anyways, the only number that is measured when you use this formula is your temperature. When you're doing a problem like this, degree C isn't always going to be the same number. You're going to measure it. In my case, I said, well, it's 45.6. And I measured it with a te thermometer. That's the device that measures temperature. There are different types. I think you've seen the one with the line it used to be mercury, now it's alcohol. And you also have electronic, even the electronic ones, like you know, you one you take your temperature now is electronic. Those are usually three or four significant figures. Does that help, Katie? Yes, that does. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you for your question. All right, let's move on. Now, for a lot of this, what I'm going to talk about now 
I'm going to turn the switch, we'll be on the test, click to the off position. Now, when you measure, make a measurement, you have a measurement that has units. And there are two systems, the English system and the metric. Remember, switch is off right here. But both of these we use, and in chemistry, we use mainly the metric in the laboratory. You know, chemical plant in the United States is English. In Europe, it's metric. I've worked in both. So when we talk about the metric system, which is what we use in chemistry and a lot of science, the word metric comes from the Greek word metro, which means to measure. Again, click, switches off. I'll never ask this on a test. Now, oh, how did it get small? That's better. Now, again, switches off, but the metric unit for length is the meter. And one meter equals 100 centimeters, and one kilometer, kilometer, is 1,000 meters. And if you look at some of the older cars, I don't know about the newer ones with the digital. I have an older car with an analog meter. The outside is English miles per hour in my car, and the inner side is uh, kilometers. And why did they do that? Well, this way they can sell that same car when it was made in Canada, which uses the metric system. Oh, that reminds me of a quick story. I worked in Germany, and one time one of my colleagues, who was also a manager, on a Saturday, and by the way, um, European country uh, companies, at least the ones I work for, when you're visiting that country, they assign you a host. So you never have to be alone if you don't want to, like on the weekends. And when I was in Chicago, I worked for both companies that were European based, but had Chicagoland, uh, offices or research center here. And when someone from Europe came over, they still followed the same European, we'd have a host for them. And I would do that because I knew Chicago quite well. But anyways, one day, a Saturday, my host, I was in one city, and he took me to Munich, which is not called, no, he took me to Cologne, which is called Kuhn. And we went from where I was outside of Mir I forgot which, David, no, not David. I was in Emmerich, and we went to Cologne. And we went on the Autobahn. And he was in a pretty fast car, an Audi. And it was two-lane part of it, no speed limit. And we were doing, I don't know, over 150, 200 kilometers per hour. And I said, could I drive? And he said, no. You get us killed if you don't know how to drive on the Autobahn. And I saw what he meant. We Once in a while, we'd pass a car and we get in the outside lane. But if you weren't in a fast car, you stayed in the inside lane, not the passing lane, because it was about a 40 minute drive from where we were and it was exciting. You'd see these Porsches and Ferraris come by. I don't know how fast they were going, but it was like, couple hundred miles an hour, our method. But anyways, that's my Ferrari. Oh, it's time to take a five minute break. Let's take a five minute break. I can get up and stretch. We'll continue on after the break.
I'm back. I was just looking out my weather window, otherwise known as my living room window, and it's raining, not that heavy. And thank goodness there's no ice forming. I hope there isn't for a while. But anyways, let's get back to work. Now, I was talking about the different, uh, the metric system, and for length, and again, switches off, the unit is a meter. I don't know about you, but I have not a yardstick, but a meter stick that also has the English inches on there. But anyways, one meter is 100 centimeters, one kilometer is 1,000 meters, and I'll never ask that on a test. Now, volume, the unit is the liter. And one liter, I don't know what happened to my slides here. I guess the dreaded, I'm going to mess with your slides virus got me. All right. One liter is a thousand cubic centimeters, which is abbreviated by CM superscript three. But most of you are more familiar with one liter equals a thousand milliliters. And milliliters is abbreviated by an L, ML. And I don't have it here, but liter is abbreviated by a capital L. Now, I should point out one millimeter, milliliter is the same as one cubic centimeter. But on Things like my water bottle, you can see 700 milliliters when it was full. But if you look on medical syringes, they usually have the set of milliliters, a lot of them. I don't know if they've changed it. I haven't seen one in a while. When I worked in a lab, in a chemical lab, we'd use syringes to add certain liquids to our reaction. And that would always be in CM superscript three centimeters. And they're the same. Now, the metric unit mass unit is a gram. Now mass is a measure of the total quality, quantity of matter in an object. Now, weight is somewhat different. And again, switch is still off. Weight is a measure of total force exerted on an object by the pull of gravity. So I'm going to do something that some chemists would, how should I say this, object to what I'm going to do, but I've done it all my life. And it works with the following assumption. Between now and the end of the semester, how many of you are planning on leaving our planet Earth? Oh, no one. So we're always going to be under the same gravitational field. So mass and weight mean the same. And you'll hear me say more than what mass. I'll probably say, well, the weight of this. So I'll use those interchangeably. But that's only because I know I'm not and you're not leaving our planet. If we were on the moon, then I'd have to be careful, but I'm not going there. Are you or Mars or Jupiter or wherever? All right. Now, when we talk about metric and now I better, there are certain prefixes that are important that are in our vocabulary, and we use in chemistry. Now, for this one, I'm going to be subtle, switches on.
when I originally made up this chart, this table, I put a lot down. In real life, you don't have to know all of them, but there's some I want you to know. And a kilo, like in a kilometer or kilogram, is a thousand. Oh, that reminds me, let me go 10 to the third. And it's abbreviated by a K. Now, the unit of measure for mass is a gram. And 1,000 grams, remember 1,000, the prefix is kilo. So you put the units, grams, with the prefix, 1,000 kilo, and you get kilo, kilogram. Now, if you ever watch any of those movies like where they have illegal drugs coming on our TV shows. I don't know if you are old enough to remember Miami Vice. That was a good, really good program. And they'd always be bringing in illegal drugs like cocaine. And if you see on the movie or the TV, someone will say, we're bringing 150 kilos tonight in at midnight. I don't know why they always do it at midnight because they think maybe the police don't sleep. <laughs> they're they're going to be awake knowing if that might, but anyways, what do I mean by a kilo? Well, that short the slang on TV, I wonder if it's the same way in real life. I don't know. I've never had an experience with that, nor do I want to, but they shorten kilogram to kilo as 10 to the third. So that's a thousand grams. By the way, one uh, kilogram equals 2.2 .2 pounds. But in chemistry, in this class, we use the metric system grams. Interesting, when I was in the United States and working in chemical plants, it would always be in pounds. If you go to Europe, it's always in kilograms. And let's see, I've been in chemical plants in the Netherlands, Germany, England, and France. And I've gotten around. So anyways, you should know Kilo. Now, if you have a computer, you know how many mega or gigabytes your hard drive is, and now also tera, and a mega is 10 to the sixth, a giga is 10 to the ninth. Now, we're not going to use that in this class, but you should know centi is 10 to the minus two, and here for kilo, you should know kilo is 10 to the third. And the other thing is milli, like in milliliter, you should know 10 to the minus third. So kilogram means a thousand of something, 10 to the third. Centi means a hundredth, 10 to the minus two. That's what that equals. And milli equals a thousandth, 10 to the minus three equals 1,000. And on the test, micro is 10 to the mi minus six, which is a millionth, and that we're not going to use. The ones I have the red arrow to and underline in red, you should know. On a test, I can ask you, what does kilo mean? And the answer is 10 to the third or a thousand. You can do either way. What does centi mean? 10 to the minus two or a hundred? But no, the scientific, that's better. And what is milli? 10 to the minus three. And therefore, you should know these. I could also ask you what prefix to use when a number is 10 to the third, and that's a kilo, and so on. All right, know these prefixes to know the ones I outlined, kilo, centi, and milli. I used to have everybody learn all of them, but it's not necessary anymore. By the way, nano, just a little thing, is a billion, 10 to the minus nine, and if you're in following things in our society and science, a major area that started in 1995 
was nanoparticles. Those are very small, not this small, smaller, one billionth of a meter, nano. All right, now, if you have bought the book, which you didn't have to, there's in this chapter, it's called Conversion Factors and what I call, also called Dimensional, which I call Unit Analysis. And conversion factors are a ratio that specif specifies how one unit of a measurement is related to another. In other words, how do you convert from one to the other? An example would be, oh, 12 of something equals a dozen. And if you were converting, you wouldn't know if I had Oops. And switch is off right now, and I'll explain why in a little while. If you had 12 dozen eggs, you could convert this using this conversion. One dozen equals 12 of something you know you have 24 eggs. Now, sometimes where here eggs are discrete exact numbers, but when they're not, you should use significant figures. And I'll teach you this when we get to it. Now, in the book, they have what's called problem solving, and I call it unit analysis. And this is a general problem solving, it switches off right now, method, which I'll be teaching you later when we need it, in which in about a week or two, I'll go over it in depth, in which units associated with numbers are used as guides in setting up calculations. So if you notice I have here, I'll cover this later. What I mean by that is, I'm gonna teach you about, are you ready for this? Your good buddy, your good friend, unit analysis. And I've been using unit analysis since my senior year in high school. I was taking AP chemistry. I still remember him. Our chemistry teacher was also the chairman of the science department at my high school. I went to Niles West in Skokie. Go Niles West. But anyways, he taught us unit analysis. And I'll be forever grateful to Mr. Solners. I still remember his name decades later. I can still picture him. Great man, taught me a lot, taught everybody a lot. And he beat entire head unit analysis. And since then, I've used it. And when I've done calculations to calculate certain things that you use in a chemical plant, you're talking those calculations are dealing with about $200,000, $250,000 in chemicals. If you blow it, make a big mistake, you've wasted $250,000 in chemicals, labor time, and then you got to dispose of that mess. That's a lot of money. And you get fired if you make a mistake. I never did because I used my good buddy, my good friend, you in analysis, and I'll teach you about that when the time is right. Now, in this chapter, they have and switches off, but I'll talk about it. I think we also do a lab, density. Density is a ratio of mass of an object to volume of an object. Here is density, mass of an object or substance to volume. Now, this won't be ever on a test, but
lower density objects, again, switches off, but I do want to cover it. This is something you should know about. Lower density objects or substances float in higher density substances. And let me change this. I got it in. And this is the opposite. and higher density substances sink, go to the bottom of a container in lower density. So what this means is if you put something that's a low density into a substance with the higher density, it will float on top. If you take something that's a high density and you put it in something like a liquid that's a lower density, that higher density will sink. What does that mean? Let's have some fun with this, even though this won't be on its ass. Does everybody see on your screen? Let's see, did I? Nope, I didn't want to do that. All right. You should see density of lead is 11.3 grams per milliliter. Now, water has a density at room temperature 1.00. So if you put a lead cannonball in a barrel of water, guess what's going to happen? Put a cannonball in a barrel of water, it sinks. Why? Because the density of lead is higher than the density of water. Now, let's go back and still have some more fun. Now, a density of a feather is 0 0.0025 grams per cubic centimeter, which means grams per milliliter. Water is 1.0, so a feather has a much, much lower density than water. And if you had a barrel of water or bucket and you had a feather, nope, I don't have a feather with me, but assume you did and you dropped it in there, guess what? it's gonna float on top because it has a lower density. And that's the important thing about density. I think the density of a human body is very close to 1.00, which is why you can float or sometimes you sink. And that's all I'm gonna say about density. Remember lower density substances float on higher density substances and higher density substances sink in lower density substances. Oh, one more thing. Well, let's go out to the internet. Ah, Ken Simply Vinaigrette. No, I didn't know I had my own company. But can everybody see this bottle here? Right here, and you see there are two layers. The bottom layer has seasoning, but it also has water. The top layer is 
oil, vegetable oil in these usually, or olive oil, probably vegetable. Oh, this says olive oil. Now, olive oil has a density of about 0.8 grams per milliliter. Water, the bottom layer, is about 1.0. And that's why you see the two layers when they separate. And that's why the oil is always going to be on the top and the water is on the bottom because of the density of those substances. But you didn't think about salad dressing as chemistry. Chemistry is everywhere. Oh no, guess what? We've just finished this appendix. So you know what time it is? It's time for a new chapter. And the new chapter is chapter two. Let me just close the appendice. Oh, what this also means is next Wednesday and probably maybe tomorrow, Friday, I'll send out an email reminding next Monday, I'll do the appendix A2 and, or I mean, I'll do chapter one problem set next Wednesday. I'll go through some of the problems on appendix A2 and A4. And you should do those before I do. Why? Or what's the reason? So you get a good grade on the test. Hopefully that's what you want. I hope. I really hope. All right. So let's get to chapter two. And chapter two deals with atoms and atomic structure. Now, interestingly enough, this book doesn't tell you what an atom is or atomic structure, but I'm gonna cover some stuff and I'll come back to what is an atom and everything in chapter three. Now, before we go into chapter two, and it might be also here in chapter two, it's time for a public service announcement from your host, Dr. White. And what is that? Chemical symbols. I'll never ask you what is a chemical symbol, but it's a one or two letter abbreviation for the names of the elements. And I'll teach you later on what's an element. Next chapter. And remember the first letter of the element is capitalized. The second letter, if there is one, is always lowercase. Now in the periodic table, there are at least the older ones, 103. I don't know how many elements are there now. Let's find out real quick. Don't you love search engines? Oh, it's up to 118. <laughs> Most of uh, yeah, the, even though when I did this in the periodic table I have is 103. But my special gift to you, instead of making you know all the elements, is these 37. What's the reason for only 37? Because these are the only ones I've used and you'll use in your daily life. So you should know H is hydrogen. If I ask, give the chemical symbol for helium, it's HE. If I ask, what's the element that has the chemical symbol AL, you should be able to write down aluminum. Now, I will be giving you an all test. Do I have it opened up? No, I don't. Yes, I do. I have this periodic table. This is the one you should be using for the test. I have stuff on my test. I know if you've gone to a different periodic table and that's called cheating, please don't. And here you have the chemical symbol, but no name. So you've got to learn them. And that's my public service announcement. that you should know these. How do you learn it? Well, you can use flashcards, but I found it's better. Write down H, 
and the word hydrogen and say it, H hydrogen, do it again, do it five times, a couple of days later, do it again, and it will be burned into your brain. Oh, by the way, when my eyes go here, I'm looking at my video where my camera is. I don't know why I do that. I'll never be a TV announcer. All right. Now, in the chapter, they talk about mole and molar mass. We'll do that later when it makes sense to cover that. Now, one of the things we'll be using a lot in this class is a chemical formula. Now, what is a chemical formula? And I'll never ask on a test what's a chemical formula, but I will show you what I will ask. Chemical formula is a notation made up of the chemical symbols, uh, symbols of the elements present in a compound. Numeric subscripts, that means below, and I'll show you this in a second, located to right, hopefully all know right from left, indicate the number of atoms of each element present in the molecule. Seaboard, for example. Oh, I got to get the word. All right, let's do a, a simple one. This is the chemical formula for water. I'm going to do H2O again. When I think water, I don't think the name, I think this. And water is H2O. And what that tells you is it has one, it has hydrogen atoms, but it has two hydrogen atoms. And then since there's no subscript to the right of the O you should know is oxygen, means it has one, I'll put a dash there so you know I'm not writing the letter 10. It has one oxygen atom. How many total atoms in water? <laughs> right. When I think water, this is what I think of. I don't think of the word. But anyways, and the answer is three. Two plus one equals three. And that's something you should know how to do. Now, let's look at another common chemical you use. And this is sodium chloride. which you know as table salt. And how many atoms in sodium chloride? Well, there's one sodium and one chlorine atom. And if I ask you how many atoms are in sodium chloride, well, one plus one equals two atoms. And that's something you should know how to do. Now, quick Dr. White story. If you ever go out with a bunch of chemists to breakfast, lunch, or dinner, and I have numerous, numerous times, you'll hear at that say if you're at a restaurant at the table, one of the chemists will ask, can you please pass the knackle? Knackle, which they mean salt, the salt. And I have to admit, I've done that too. Now, there's something I need to show you is the following. And that's when you have this situation. Here, we have this molecule, calcium hydroxide. And the question is, how many atoms? And it might be 
two points or one point each. And this would be A, how many atoms in this molecule? Well, you look here, it's got one calcium. Now, when you see a bracket, a parentheses or bracket, and then something in it, elements, symbols, and then outside to the right subscript, a number, that means you multiply what's ever inside here times that number. So this tells me I have one calcium, two oxygen, one times two, plus two hydrogen, one times two, equals five atoms in this right here. So it's ever in the bracket, you multiply by the number outside subscript. And we'll pick on two again, it doesn't always have to be two. And the same question would be, in this molecule, how many atoms are there? Well, this magnesium is has no subscript here, so there's one of them. Now, all of this is inside these brackets. Therefore, what's ever inside, you multiply it by the number to the right subscript by. So one hydrogen times two means there's two hydrogen total in the molecule. One carbon times two means there's two carbons. Now oxygen inside here has a three. So you do three times two, which means there's six oxygen. And now add it up and hopefully I got it correctly. And there's, and that's the skill you should have. Now back to another one that's simple. That's the number four. And I'm going to let you try this. How many atoms are in H2SO4? It's called sulfuric acid. I'll teach you later in the semester about that molecule. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up. How many atoms are in C, H2SO4? All right, my turn. And how do you do that? You look at the number subscript to the right of the chemical symbol. And we have two hydrogens. S is sulfur. There's no number there. So that tells me I have one sulfur. Ooh, to the right of oxygen, O, subscript is four. I have four of those. So I have two hydrogen, one sulfur, four oxygen. And that is seven atoms, if I did my math correctly. And this is a skill you have. And when we go through chapter, I don't know if I have it in chapter two, I might have to put some out, but we'll cover this again. Now let's move on to the periodic table. Now on this slide, click, the switch is off. And that is, I'll talk about it, but I'm not going to ask you what's the periodic law. And that's when elements are arranged in a measurement or identification or no, what would be the right term? An aspect of that element, increasing atomic number, elements with similar properties occur at periodic, meaning regular, occurring intervals. And because of that, chemists long ago came up with what's called the periodic table. Now, I'll never ask on a test, what is the periodic table? Now, the periodic table is a tabular, meaning table, arrangement of elements in order of increasing atomic number 
which elements with similar properties are positioned in the same column of the displayer table. So this is the periodic table. Now I'm never gonna ask you, but the vertical columns are called groups and the horizontal are called periods. And I'm never gonna ask that on it. So I'll use uh, group or family really. Now let's look at the periodic table and here it is. And where is the atomic number? The atomic number is in the upper on this periodic table, upper right hand corner. And if you look at hydrogen H, its atomic number is one. A favorite element of mine over here is carbon C. And its atomic number is six. Also like nitrogen seven, oxygen eight. Now, another one I've used a lot is Cl chlorine. And its atomic number is 17. When grad school, I used a lot of argon and that's atomic number 18. So you look in the upper right-hand corner of this periodic table, sometimes they're in the upper left too, but not this one. And those are the atomic numbers. Notice as you go across, they're increasing. As you go down, they increase. Now, each column is called a group or family. Now, there's one exception, some at a time, and that's hydrogen. And I'll talk about that. It's not really in the family name of lithium, sodium, potassium. There's also rubidium, cesium, and francium, but I only ask you to learn Li, lithium, Na, sodium, K, potassium, and H, hydrogen. Now, their classification or names of groups, key groups, now the switch is on. If it was a dial that I could turn to 10, like on an amplifier, I just turned it up to 20. I stole that from the movie, this is Spinal Tap. But anyways, they're key groups and oh, I better be subtle. And that's the name of key groups, the alkali metals, the alkali and earth metals, the halogens, and the noble gases. And you should know, it's even on the slide, which atoms are in which groups. Now, the first column, and I'll go through this again, excluding hydrogen, this is important. The first column excluding hydrogen are the alkali metals. The next column, which in this one, you only have to learn magnesium and calcium, but strontium is a favorite one of mine, but we won't use it in this class. This is the alkaline earth metals. Now, if we go all the way over to the right, the column under the number seven, those are called the halogens. Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine are the ones you need to know. And the very last column on the right on my screen, hopefully yours too, underneath the number eight, and I'll explain later on the semester what those numbers mean. But for now, those are the noble gases. Helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon are the ones you should know. And those are the noble gases. Now, interesting story about, I don't know, 15, 20, almost 25 years ago, when I learned it, when I was in college, when I was working in, chemi in the chemical industry for many years, the last column eight were called the inert gases. Then very smart chemists found a way to make them react. Everybody thought, oh, they can't react. And he did. He beat on it real hard, not with a hammer, but metaphorically speaking, found reaction conditions that were very severe that made them react. We well, couldn't call them inert gases. So the name was changed to noble gases. And 
every once in a while, I still will call them by the old name inert. But you should know the first column, except hydrogen, alkaline metals. Second column, alkaline earth metals. Second to last column on the right, the halogens. Anybody here of halogen lights? You know, like the bright ones in the street, the older ones that are an LED now? That's because they have halogen gas in them, these. And the last column on the right underneath the number eight is the noble gas. I almost said the old name, but I stopped myself. So you should know on a test, if I said, give an example of an alkali metal and give its chemical symbol, and let's go back to our periodic table. Well, the first column excluding hydrogen is an alkali metal, and you could put Na sodium, or you could put Li lithium, or K potassium. If I asked you, give an example of an alkaline earth metal, second column, number two, and you could put down Mg magnesium, Ca calcium. And finally, I or not finally, I could ask, give an example of a halogen giving its name and chemical symbol, and you could put F fluorine or Cl fluorine, Br bromine, I iodine. Or if I ask, given the name and chemical symbol of a noble gas. And the noble gases are the last column underneath the number eight. And you could put down HE, helium, NE, neon, AR, argon, KR, krypton, or XE, xenon. xenon. Those are the ones I asked you to learn. By the way, remember, unless I've been stolen to another universe, in our universe, on our planet, krypton is not a green solid that kills Superman. It's a colorless gas. I've never worked with Krypton. I've worked with Argon. If I look at the time, we're just about done. So well, let me fix my colic here. Don't look. Don't look. But anyways, remember, on Monday, I will go through Chapter 1 problem set in our lecture, but you should do it first. Next. Well, I got the frizzy today. Don't look, don't look. But anyways, on Wednesday, I will go through in our lecture, the appendix A2, A4 problem set. You should work on that before I do it. That way you'll get a good grant on test number one. I should tell you test number one always has the highest average. So you should study hard because that's the one the easiest to get the most points. And don't forget, if you want three bonus points, upload the DL contract, the safety contract to Blackboard, signed and dated before tomorrow afternoon, 10, uh, 10, 2, 23, 23, tomorrow afternoon, Thursday, 4 p.m. With that, I'm done for today. I'm also done for the week, unless you're coming to my office hour tonight from 6 to 7.15 on Zoom, different login, it's in the syllabus. With that, I'll say, well, I hope it doesn't ice out there. If not, be careful out there. Aren't you lucky you didn't have to drive to COD in this weather? But anyways, I'll say, remember in Yiddish, it means uh, go in health, gain gesund, be healthy, and I stole that from Granny at Beverly Hillbillies. Bye.